This is the best of the Dan Levator Show with the Stugats Podcast. Greg Cody of the Miami Herald in with us today. And right before these microphones went on, there was just yammering all over the studio. Let me explain to you what my life is like before these microphones go on, because <laughs> Stugat uh, calls up the questions on Highly Questionable and just starts making fun of them, because Stugat thinks he can do every job at ESPN better than the people doing the jobs at ESPN. And he was right about this when he called up this Highly Questionable question. Are the Dodgers completely hosed without Corey Seager? Yeah, all those producers should be fired, all of them, <laughs> if that's a question on the show. But while this is going on, Greg Cody is just wearing me out about how the Dolphins have the fourth-best quarterback situation in the AFC East. Like, he's just coming back at me again and again. Ryan Tannehill's average. I'd rather have the Jet situation. I'd rather have the Bills situation. And then, apropos of nothing that I can tell, Billy, who isn't involved in either of these conversations, just shouts the phrase, he's a compiler. It's true. Who? He's right. Nolan Ryan was a yeah. compiler. He was. <laughs> I'm not certain that Nolan Ryan was that great. He yeah. pitched 26 seasons. Oh, come on. He was only 30 games. He had 324 wins in 26 seasons. Dan, that's ridiculous. You want to know why this came up? I'll tell you exactly why this came up. Because I'm often, you know, getting criticized for wanting pitchers to pitch no hitters. And everybody tells me, oh, no, they can't pitch more than 100 pitches. Their arms, their arms, their arms. Nolan Ryan had a game in 1974 against Louis Tiant where he pitched 13 innings, 235 pitches. Wow. You know what happened to his arm after that? He pitched for 19 more seasons and had five no hitters after that. All right? <laughs> so spare me. Nolan Ryan definitely did not deserve to get in with 98% of the vote. The compiler. He was a compiler. Look at his numbers, Dan. Look at his numbers. It's totally fair. 324, 292. Not a ton of postseason starts. Pitched on some very well, bad you, teams, well, but you can make the argument, man, that he's not a Hall of Famer. You if, can't, you can't make that argument. It can be made. Look no at the numbers. No sane person can make that mm. argument. You guys are going to do again wins and losses when Rick Helling almost won 20 games in one, one year with his career. Five? Mm. 1.24 with his career. 1.24. Whip is not great for a career. Yeah, if we're great. talking compiling, Derek Jeter was a compiler. Oh, I mean, yeah. That guy was, that, he huh? was never the best shortstop in the game. For the Pirates, he played he like 58 seasons. Fan. That's he why he has 3,000 hits. Who is, who is the greatest of the compilers? You guys are, are just, you guys are all gibberish and nonsense, but who, who can you accuse of le legitimate compiling? And have it be a smear. I should go. I should go back into that studio. Can you guys get me a fencing glove so I could slap Chris and Billy across the face? Look, <laughs> man, you can have all the problems you want with Derek Jeter and his career. And I thought he was overrated as well, and he wouldn't have gotten all that attention if he'd been doing all the same things with the Pirate. But he's a Hall of Fame player. He is not a compiler. Never even close to the best shortstop in baseball. That is true. Yeah. He was always like the third, fourth guy. He just played forever. Mm -hmm. Compiling it. And he played on the Yankees, which is why he was in all those All-Star games. Seriously. He should not have been in half of those All-Star games. Let's be real. Come on. And by the way, this Didi Gr Gregorius is quickly making people forget about Derek Jeter yeah. in New York. Yeah, about far that? better than Jeter ever was. All right, put it on the poll. Is Didi Gregorius making everyone forget about Jeter? Go ahead, put it on the poll. I feel like Biggio is in this mix, too, man. Compiler. Yeah. So yeah. You, you hang around long enough, you get enough of the important well, stats, if, you get if, yourself into the if, Hall of if Fame. I so may, dumb. If I may explain some basic math to the people in this room, it's pretty hard to get to 3,000 hits without playing a lot of seasons. Yeah, yeah. But if you play 26 seasons, Dan, and you get like 110 hits a season, you'll have 3,000. Uh, Billy, that's not what Biggio was doing. Biggio was, and that's not what Jeter was doing. It mm. was double those hits. Eh, debatable. Mm. It, not 3, debatable. Not debatable. Go ahead. Yeah, Feel yeah. free to use a computer. It's where young people can uh, find things instead well, of learning. That's where I found all this Nolan Ryan information. I mean, you agree on Biggio, close to 20 years in the bigs. If you're that good of a hitter, you'll have somewhere around 4,000 hits. Exactly. Right? 200 yeah. hits a season is 4,000 in 20 seasons. Yeah, you, can I, hit two, you can hit 250 and get 3,000 hits. Right. The guy just had a dirty helmet. I mean. Made him look like he was doing things, hustling, sliding, right. making plays. All he right. really wasn't. Put though. that on the poll. Uh, that's right. He's a, he's a, <laughs> he is a, he's not a Hall of Famer with a clean helmet, Dan. Let's be honest. Adrian Beltre is another one. Dirty helmet. Yeah. yeah. He, he's sneaky good. 
Adrian he's Beltre? Not sneaky good. He's sneaky no, good. He's great. No, he's no, sneaky no, no, no. good. You totally if, snuck up on. Yeah, me. if someone said to you Adrian Beltre first ballot Hall of Famer, you'd be like, no chance. But he's going to be. He he's is, really he is a good. Great baseball player. What are you talking about? Sneaky good. Sneaky put, good. Guillermo, put it on the poll. Can Hall of Famers be sneaky good? Yeah. He's point. going to be sneaky good. Yeah, sneaky. sneaky good. Also, I'm looking at Cal Ripken Jr. stats. I am with you. I am not <laughs> impressed. I mean, who better to be the ultimate compiler than the guy that just played more games than anybody? That's the thing. Exactly. If you never take yes. a day off, you're going to get the stats. Here's what you can do. Here's with just yeah. teens home runs. We're talking teens. Several years where you can't get into the 20s. Here's what he compiled. A 276 career average. That's average. By the way, the only Hall of Fame voter in the room just looked at Adrian Beltre's career stats, is not sold on him as a first ballot guy. Wow. a boy. Not sold. a boy. 3,000 hits, though, Greg. But 287, four all-star appearances. That's a little light. That kind of thing. Nolan Ryan only had like seven all-star appearances in 26 years. What? Dan. Well, that, Dan, that, that's come 58% on. more than uh, four by my math. I, I don't know why people like Cal exact. Ripken. I don't know why people like Cal Ripken so much because all he did was compile all star appearances. I guess he had a tremendous smile and those yeah. smoky eyes. You know yeah. what? I look past that because I went to see Cal Ripken his final season at Joe Robbie Stadium, and you know what he did? He was not signing autographs for people the game that I was there. He was hanging out in the outfield on the rubber warning track by the giant wall where no one could talk to him. I don't think he was that nice of a guy. Two dollars. Put on the pole, please. At right. left- at Levitard Show, all of you. What? Phil Necro, another compiler. Oh, that's a great one. I feel like Gaylord Perry's also in that conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Put it on the poll, Guillermo, at Levitard Show. I'm trying to keep up. Would Craig Biggio have been in the Hall of Fame with a clean helmet? No. Did Cal Ripken Jr. have a tremendous smile and smoky eyes? <laughs> I don't think Mariano would have that many saves if he wasn't on the That's Yankees. Another, great Another one. Mm-hmm. You are on it today, boy. Should be a compiler Hall of Fame. Right. right. Yes. Well, it's it's yes. what I was there trying to do five Hall minutes ago when you guys went down this route. It's what I was trying to do five minutes ago. There's a compiler Hall of Fame. It's called Monument Park in Yankee Stadium. That's right. Uh, what do you do with this uh, compiler Hall of Fame? Is it a room in the actual Hall of Fame? Is is it a no, separate storage. building? It's, 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 storage. Yeah, it's storage. It's storage. It's storage. It's a shed where you hoard. Who are the compilers who are going in there? First ballot. <laughs> All of sports, though. It's, it's a it's a compiler Hall, Hall of sports. Fame. It's a shed behind the baseball. It's Hall Greg's of Fame. garage. That's right. It's <laughs> a, it, it, is a, it is the dirty garage, rat infested garage yeah. of an old man. By well, the way, well. not to change the subject, but what are the Yankees going to do? Because they're running out of numbers. They don't have any single digits left. Are they going to switch to letters? Like, what are they going to do? Because they're running out of numbers at an alarming rate. Mm, They are. They're going to go to triple digits. Pretty soon, players are going to start wearing like 194. This Roger Maris was terrible. Oh, yeah. His career batting average, just 260. This guy was terrible. That's right. But he had the one thing. He hit 61 home runs. Roger Maris is uh, analogous to, uh, one Joe Namath, to Joe Namath. He had the one thing that he's famous for. That's the one thing that Hank Aaron never did, which makes Hank Aaron a compiler. Oh, wow. Well, I did, did Hank ever hit 50 in a season? No, he was just like, he had a oh. couple seasons where he was just 40s, 40s. Wow. Steady Eddie, 40s, 30s, 20s, yeah. 40 again. Just never the monster year. Overrated. So you, wait a minute, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to do Hall of Famers overrated, but I'm here for Hall of Fame compilers. Is Hank Aaron, If is that the nominee we're going with? Hank Aaron. I home run king, Hank Aaron. I can't call him a compiler. And 45 was his best ever yeah. in a season. He it's compiled. A compiler. Yeah. Nah, compiler. Yeah, Hammer and Hank, man. Looked a little like Jiminy Cricket, I thought. Tell you else, uh, who else compiled? Ricky Henderson. You really didn't think Jiminy Cricket was the way to end that segment? You had to get in your Ricky Henderson there at the end because you weren't listening? Yeah. Don Libertard. Greg, are you going to say anything? Or are you just going to sit there checking the internet? When, when I have something to say, I say it. What I was thinking of as you said that was that I think Black History Month is also split into two half months, which is terrible. That's not true. It's the not first true? half and the second half of February. There you <laughs> go. Right. Stugats. No, it's February into March. Isn't no, it? Let me no, no, it's February. No, no, it's okay. Hang on. Good Hang contribution on. though when you decided to talk. That was good. Black uh, History Chris, Month. Yeah, you're, uh, 
<laughs> Greg. I'm I'm like a dog with a bone on this. Ah, I'm wrong. Okay. This is the Dan Lebatar show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. There were a number of asinine things said in the last segment, uh, each more asinine than the last by a bunch of young people who don't have any respect for anything and Stugats. Yeah. I mean, Greg's like 60. I mean, okay, but you know, listen, you guys said everything. so many things that are wrong. So let's just start here. Cal Ripken Jr. is a compiler. He's overrated. Tim Kirkshin, what do you do with that comment right there? That's ridiculous, Dan. He won two MVPs. He won fielding records. He changed the position of shortstop. He turned it with some help into an offensive position. Forget the playing streak. Look at the the body of work for a shortstop during his time. That's ridiculous. Not a Hall of Famer. I mean, you guys. I mean, All some right. people could say that the playing streak All was selfish. I mean. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. We appreciate your knowledge at every turn here. Uh, Boog Shambi, voice of Sunday Night Baseball. He uh, he sounds he sounds like baseball. Uh, Greg Cody says Adrian Beltre is not a Hall of Famer. He's got a Hall of Fame vote. He's not he's not sure about Adrian Beltre. I said I didn't think he was a first ballot. Oh, that's going to make famer. it even worse with Boog. All right, tell him what an idiot he is, Boog. You're a moron. You are the if Asinine had a picture, it'd be you. <laughs> that's right. All I right. just said that. Well, but oh, can you explain? He does sound like baseball. Uh, what, what f- first ballot? So like what? You're, you, so you won't vote for him once, but then a year later you're like, okay, now it feels. Better. You now never know, Boog. He made he four All Star teams. That's a pretty light number he's, for a Hall of Famer. He's, he, well, Am I Greg, wrong? Does that ever get? It, does it get influenced by the good, the amount of good third basemen that were playing during his era, which he has, which has nothing to do with him? Like how good was he? He's elite. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's, okay. he's in the conversation as one of the most brilliant defensive third basemen of all time. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Boog, thank I you mean, for your co- contributions yeah, and your credibility. I love you. I'm sorry that he's so disappointing to you. I, I mm-hmm. appreciate your uh, your credibility being added to this issue. Uh, Ricky Henderson is overrated. That's uh, Do I have your, your take on this correct, Stugatz? Uh, Rick- compiler, yeah. A, a, compiler. An overrated compiler. Bomani Jones, your thoughts on Stugatz's blasphemy? Spoken like a Mets fan. Yep. <laughs> That's all that is. Yeah. You didn't like the Mets fan. Because you didn't like him with the Mets? Well, also, I mean, they, they, look, that, that, they, he was playing cards in the, in the clubhouse. Remember that? Like, that's only Mets fans gibberish says that about Ricky Henderson, one of the three best left fielders of all time. Like, we're talking about Barry Bonds, Ted Williams, and Ricky Henderson. Those yeah. are the three best left fielders of all time. I wish y'all had called me about Cal Ripken because the, the game play streak was selfish. Thank you. Oh no! Thank wait you, a minute. Thank now, you. Thank hold you. on. Thank you. Hold on. Thank hold you. on a second. I got to sort this out because now we've got chaos breaking out. Uh, Tim Kirkshin, Bomani Jones just said that the Cal Ripken streak was selfish. Um, what do you think? What do you say to that? Well, he's in the majority opinion on that, but I covered the team. Bomani didn't cover the team. Woo! You didn't cover yeah. the team. Woo! Like, what are you going to play? Shots are you going to play Jackie Gutierrez at shortstop over Cal Ripken? You really think he went into the season saying, I'm going to hurt my team by playing every single day? <laughs> I think, hey, hey, man, every now and then you need a break. And before that 1991 MVP season that should have gone to Seth Fielder, let us not pretend that he didn't have three or four down Cal Ripken years, probably because he was tired. <laughs> that a boy, Bo. Let him have it, man. Tim, I can't believe what's here. happened here. I yeah. thought it was going to be Stugatz against Tim Kirchin, and now the whole thing has gone off the rails. Tim, what? Do, what oh, do wait, you... Stugatz, wait, Stugatz was the one who said the Cal Ripken would be a self? Yep. Compiler. I disagree. Okay, now you I disagree. disagree. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, Tim, but the other room wants to argue with you about this stuff. The shipping container wants to argue about what? What are you guys well, saying? first off, that? all Kyle Ripken was was a great smile and smoky eyes. Totally overrated. Yeah. Also, to me, though, Derek boy. Jeter doesn't make the Hall of Fame as if he's a Pittsburgh Pirate. We all know that's this. Sad, that's man. not true. Uh, yeah. It's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, never true, never the true, best. Also, Hank Aaron never really erupted one season. Just your classic sort of compiler. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. That is right. Tell you, <laughs> Tim, you played 25 seasons. I mean, you're going to put up those kinds uh, of numbers. Tim laughed in your face. All right. Attack each of those one after another, Tim. Okay. (laughs) Sorry to Bomani. I was just trying to make a point that I covered the guy 
And I thought it's important that you go out there and play every day if you can. And he could because I watched him because I was there. Hank Aaron is a compiler. <laughs> oh, my God. That's the dumbest thing that's ever been said on the <laughs> dumbest <laughs> show. No, no, 22 no, years. 22 no, years. No, 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 22 years. You should have a thousand no, homers in 22 nicer. years. You can be nicer about it. You don't have to raise your voice. By the way, Chan Hopart grooved that pitch to Kyra yeah, Consumer. Oh, totally great boy. Great boy. Great boy. Great boy. Great boy. by those yeah. smoky yeah. eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, you agree on Jeter, though? Derek Jeter would not be in the Hall of Fame if he did all of those things for the Pirates. He wouldn't do all those things for the Lifetime Pirates. Lifetime 300 hitter, more hits than Willie Mays, 3,000 hits, all those all-star teams, just a compiler. Never the best At shortstop. That position. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, yep. Just to bury the Hall of Fame voter, Adrian Beltre, Tim Kirchin, what do you say there in terms of Hall of Fame? He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. That's obvious. Look at the numbers. Look at the power. Look at the defensive excellence. Look at the longevity. Look at how many games he played at third base. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Four All Star appearances. That's a little light for Cooper Strong. Greg, yep. What's the argument, Bill? You're making against Nolan Ryan. What is the argument? Not instead of just shouting overrated. Make the argument against Tim Kirchner. Well, he he pitched for 26 years. He only had 324 wins. <laughs> He he shouldn't have gotten in with ninety nine percent of the vote. That's I mean he's a compiler. Yep. Okay, he had Randy Johnson, who's second all time on the list, would need three more three hundred strikeout seasons <laughs> to pass Nolan Ryan on the all time strikeout list. Look, I'll give you that he was a bit overrated. To not acknowledge that he's a first ballot Hall of Famer is equally preposterous <laughs> as everything else said on this show. He is the greatest power pitcher of all time, mm. and he is the hardest pitcher to hit in Major League history. That's who he is. And since when is longevity such a bad thing? He was good enough to be in a rotation from basically almost age 19 to 45. Since when is that a bad thing? If he was overrated and wasn't any good, he wouldn't have made the rotation, made the club. Mm, the guys he had lots of so fives and nines and fives and fives at the end of his career, Tim. All right, but wins and losses are no longer important. At least that's what we're told. Go look at the other numbers. Look, he gave up 12 grand slams. He walked way too many guys in his career. He lost way too many games. He's not one of the 10 best pitchers of all time. He's not one of the 20 best pitchers of all time. But do not acknowledge that he's a first ballot Hall of Famer is stupid. All right. You, very impressive <laughs> so stats right. that you rattled I off love, the top of your head. I love that he does that off the top of his head. And Billy got no information other than sports fan he's overrated. But I feel like we're making some progress <laughs> no, here. We're not no, we're no, I did. Well, yeah. here's the yeah. deal. I, you, with all those impressive stats, I Googled Nolan Ryan and a Bleacher Report article of the 50 most overrated baseball players popped up, and he was number one. Also, Roger Maris is bad. Wow. On Bleacher Report, Tim. All right. Oh, great. That's really good. Um, listen, Roger Maris won back-to-back MVP. He didn't just have one 61 home run season. He won the MVP in 1960. How many guys won back-to-back MVPs? Not too many. Is he a Hall of Famer? No. He's not a Hall of Famer. Is he one of the great defensive right fielders that we've seen? Yes. He is. Did he have one of the best throwing arms ever? Yes. Did he do it cleanly? We think he did. But to say that he is overrated, who is saying he should be in the Hall of Fame? Nobody is saying that. Flash in the pan. Uh, Tim, thank you. Buy low. Sell high. Time for some ads. I'm sorry we put you through that, Tim. Don Lebatard. I love me some doctors. Have a lot of respect for the medical profession. Stugats. Except chiropractors. This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Dan Lebatard Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil performance line. Get the feeling of being rewarded with gold status at Shell with the Fuel Rewards program. Download the Fuel Rewards app. Join and start saving five cents a gallon today. Here's your Sports Center update. Pat Riley says that Hassan Whiteside was out of shape and wasn't conditioned mentally to battle in the playoffs. Tom Brady confirms to Jim Gray that he will be playing this season. And finally, Jackie Chan once held an egg inside his hand and broke 12 concrete blocks with that hand without damaging the egg. That's great. 
or that Jim Gray somehow has all the scoops on Tom Brady. When did Jim Gray become the mouthpiece for Tom Brady? Seriously, when did that happen? Probably, you know? probably about when he got a uh, Hollywood star of fame uh, the, in a video tribute that included Bill Clinton. Right. Oh, good point. For all the latest headlines and information, tune in the Sports Center on ESPN Radio all throughout the day. But let's get to those blasphemous Tom Brady comments, non comments. <laughs> so Tom Brady is asked, well, let's just get to Jim Gray. We haven't seen him in a while. He just pops up to, you know, create a crack across the American fault line when LeBron is changing teams. Jim Gray just shows up to stir the pot. That's right. Yep. He, he, he goes shows away. Up for only the big stuff. And then baby. the biggest scoops. That's right. Yeah. He shows up for only the big stuff. It was weird seeing the interview because it seemed like it was in an auditorium or something because Jim Ray will Jim Gray will not do an interview just sitting around with you. There has to be an auditorium full of people. Guillermo, put it on the poll. <laughs> if Jim Gray is interviewing you, does there have to be an auditorium full of people? He's been doing this the last couple of years uh, with Tom Brady because I always remember around this time, yeah. Jim Gray is always in an auditorium with Tom Brady in what looks like a paid speaking engagement. It is. It's an annual thing that Tom does, right? And they both get paid a lot of money. And Tom says something. He always gives Jim something, a little okay, something. Okay, but this was something, not something. Let's listen to the sound. This is Tom Brady literally saying Nothing in a congressional way. Do you feel appreciated by them, and do they have the appropriate gratitude for what you have achieved? I plead the fifth. <laughs> okay, make that Jim Gray laugh some music in the next segment, if you don't mind, please. Uh, Tom Brady, I understand why he would feel underappreciated by that team, perpetually asked to take discounts, not consulted on personnel decisions until recently, probably thinks that he's as responsible for the, the success as Belichick is. I'm just surprised. Maybe more. I'm just surprised to see him do that because uh, pleading the fifth is the the most upsetting thing that you can do to Bill Belichick, the Patriots way, public controversy. Get your Boston fans a titter. It's it's anti-team. It's anti-sacrifice. It's anti the things that Tom Brady has always represented. But I get why he feels that way. I don't because, A, uh, his wife makes more money than he did, does. And I don't think he in particular should be complaining about taking discounts when the other side of that discount is championship rings. The other side of that discount is the ability for Belichick to go out and get players he needs to augment um, Brady and make his uh, waning career easier. It's also a thing he's been celebrated for. Like Brady, like those are the reports that Brady was willing to take pay cuts so the team could improve. Like he's been celebrated for that his entire career. Now he has an issue. All right, so why is he saying that? Why is he saying that? Uh, why is he saying it now? Why is he saying it? Why does he feel unappreciated? Dan, Dan's mic just stopped working, so i got to go in there and fix it. Dan's yeah. mic and swap it out. Um, I Listen, the reason I think that Brady's actually doing this right now, I think there is something to the fact that Bill Belichick was going to treat Tom Brady. It's the best theory I have, Greg. We have no way of knowing if this is right. But I think that uh, Brady sensed a year or two ago that Belichick was going to treat Brady the same way he's treated every player. Hey, I got a young quarterback here, Jimmy Garoppolo. You got three or four years left. This kid's got 20 years left. And I think he probably wanted to do something with Tom Brady. And Tom Brady does. I think he feels appreciated by the crafts. I do not think he feels appreciated by Bill Belichick. But you know what? Get in line. Because there's a whole bunch of players who don't feel appreciated by Bill Belichick. Right. And and whatever their relationship is, Belichick and Brady, whatever that relationship is, man, just swallow all the, the flaws in it and the imperfections because it wins. I mean, it's the uh, arguably the best coach superstar relationship in the history of sports. Right. So swallow whatever uh, imperfections there are, man. Come on, Brady. I mean, it was it was so weird a month the, ago. Yeah, okay. You know, he's like, I, I may retire. I'm not committed to coming back. I mean, what's up with that? You got a good thing going. You know, play out the string, win another ring, and uh, retire on top. Quit complaining. But if if what I said is true, if it's accurate. If Tom Brady is indeed upset at Bill Belichick because he wanted to go Jimmy Garoppolo for the next two decades and get rid of Tom Brady, does he have a right to be upset and feel disrespected? A guy, and Greg, you have to factor in that maybe this is a guy who feels like he's as important, if not more important, to the Patriots' success than Bill Belichick. Right. So, so the theory then would be that Brady forced 
the Patriots hand and in essence forced them to trade Garoppolo. Yes. Okay. Yep. All like right. went over Belichick's head, went to the craft, said, Hey, I'm not leaving. I'm going to be here five more years. Like right. go trade that kid. Well, and and that's what they did. But, so I don't think his problem is with the crafts or the organization. I think his problem, like many of the players, Gronk too, is with Bill Belichick. Mm-hmm. That's it. Brady, though, like LeBron James, is aging so well, showing zero signs of decline. The idea that you're going to bench Tom Brady or force him into an early retirement to, to play Garoppolo is patently ridiculous. Cash Moore of the Dan Levatar Show with the Stugats, 10 to 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about Bobby. Bobby, the basketball boy, they called him. Bobby wanted to go pro someday, so he was always out in the driveway shooting hoops. But one day, his mom came out and told him, Hey, your wife wants you to take out the trash? His mom was visiting, and Bobby was a grown man. He had kind of missed his window. Plus, no one had ever seen him actually make a basket. But on the other hand, Bobby had heard how Geico could save him money on car insurance, so he switched and saved. So, it was all good. Don Lebatard. Lucky for you, that's what I like, that's what I like. Sex by the fire at night, silk sheets and diamonds all white. Lucky for you, that's what I like, that's what I like. Lucky for you, that's what I like, that's what I like. If you say you want a good time, well, here I am, baby, here I am, baby. Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Tell me what's on your mind, what's on your mind. If you want it, girl, come and get it. All this is here for you. Tell me, baby, tell me, tell me, baby. What you're trying to do. Gold jewelry shining so bright, strawberry champagne on ice. Oh, go bleep yourself. Stugats. Honestly, it's offensive. I'm offended on behalf of, of, of everyone who's ever made music that that's the song of the year. This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. Let's rip through 10 minutes of basketball talk here. NBA playoffs. Jeff Van Gundy with us. Thank you, Jeff, for being on with us as always. Let's start here. Your Pat Riley. How do you fix the heat? I'm not sure they need fixing. I, I think uh, some of their signings, like o- o- Olenek, turned out to be very good. I think they would have to hope that uh, Whiteside comes back better, uh, both mentally, physically, and then Waiters as well. Um, I think the signing of Ellington or somebody like him who is a sniper from the perimeter uh, is a necessity for them. So, again, I don't. I don't think they need fixing. I just think... Uh, they need uh, health, and they need uh, their highest paid guy to play um, much better. Well, explain to me what happened there. Yeah, I don't know. I think until you're on the inside, you're really not sure how much of it was a physical issue and how mu- much of it, is, uh, it was a lack of role acceptance. Um, big centers like Whiteside, who are not, um, you know, who – struggle when they have to go out onto the perimeter can can be minimized a little bit because you can always put a shooting big out there to stretch them out of their comfort level and take away from their greatest strength, which is protecting the basket. Um, so uh, as a center, it's easier to uh, cover up that guy's strengths and also to take him out of the paint and eliminate their shot blocking ability. So uh, I'm not sure how much is physical, how much is mental, uh, but they need him to play better because he is a very good player when he's right. All right, well, hold on a second. When you say lack of role acceptance, give me the time in Jeff Van Gundy's career where he had the most problems with a player and a lack of role acceptance. I would say it, when I first uh, had Marcus Camby, uh, who was a number two pick in the draft? We, we got we had him in a trade uh, for Charles Oakley, and I was bringing him off the bench. Uh, I thought that was a challenge because he was a very good player. Uh, unfortunately, we had very good players uh, as well at that position, so we we had a little bit of a glut there. Uh, but he was so smart and so versatile uh, that even though he didn't like coming off the bench, ultimately he was a team guy, and so. He did what was best for the group, and he played very well. Jeff, how do you see the Spurs situation unfolding with Kawhi Leonard? Well, the whole situation uh, just surprises me. 
because you just don't see it in San Antonio. Uh, you rarely see it with as big a star as Leonard, uh, who's unhappy. You know, who's there's something going on. I shouldn't say he's unhappy because I don't know that, but there's some something going wrong uh, there. And the Spurs are such an outstanding organization. It, it's really perplexing to me uh, that they don't seem to can agree on. Uh, Number one, what the problem is. Number two, uh, who should be trying to help him medically. And, and three, uh, how they're going to proceed going forward. So when a guy misses a whole year, basically, and he's up for a super max contract, I think it, it makes everyone stop and think, uh, how should we proceed with this relationship? And uh, it's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out. I suspect uh, it will it will turn out well for both Leonard and the Spurs, though. Did you read this story by Ramona Shelburne and Michael uh, Michael C. Wright? Did you read this? Yes. And I what did, did you, what did you make of it? Because this is a long, thorough report on Kawhi Leonard, San Antonio. You're reading all of this, and you're still coming on the air here, being super careful with your words and saying I'm perplexed by it. This story is pages and pages long. How are you still perplexed by it? You know what I mean? Like I'm not, I haven't read it yet. But what what is happening here that Jeff Van Gundy, who knows basketball, knows these personalities, can't figure out what's happening here? Well, I always, I again, I, I'm always hesitant because. When, when stories aren't sourced uh, and you don't know who's saying who um, and maybe why they're saying what they're saying, it's very hard for me to come to a conclusion. And I know this is how um, sports reporting has gone, or maybe all reporting has gone, um, but it always gives me hesitation to fully accept uh, non-sourced quotes uh, because I don't know again, purpose of those quotes or, you know, who those people are and how reputable or how unreputable they may be. Well, let me ask you this, Jeff, when you read this journalism, because you've been at this for a long time and you know these are good journalists writing this story, like who is somebody who's writing a story and Jeff Van Gundy's reading and saying it, I know that's so. I trust that this person is well-sourced enough and has the perspective to be able to be discerning about how they're writing this. You're talking about which sources? And No, I'm which, talking about what can you read? What can Jeff Van Gundy read that he's going to believe? Direct quotes from people. Like if Kawhi Leonard is quoted, if Kawhi Leonard's uncle's quoted, if Greg Popovich is quoted, if R.C. Buford is quoted. Uh, I, be, I, I give credence to direct quotes. I, I don't like when people, because I, I, I don't like, I don't just fully believe, not the journalist, but the quotes, because um, I know everybody has an agenda and an objective. And if you're not willing to put your name on it, I just don't take it as truth. Some people do. That's fine. That's their choice. I choose to be reticent when I read unsourced quotes. Jeff, is there anything I could say or do to get you to become the next Knicks head coach? Please. Come <laughs> well, on, Jeff. Listen, the Knicks have a they're, – they're in an interesting time, again, uh, of change. Uh, certainly they have a number of people that they've interviewed that are highly, highly qualified. I think the biggest thing that any team who struggled uh, like the Knicks have – for the last few years, they have to ask themselves, um, how much change does just changing a coach by itself do? And how much else must change for us to achieve real change? And Wow. That was some fortune cookie bleep you just put together right there. Also didn't answer my question. That was good. Well, here's the other thing about Jeff Van Gundy that's becoming increasingly frustrating. Yeah. He just described the Knicks job as an interesting time of change. Jeff Van Gundy is very opinionated. I've heard these opinions, not about the Knicks, uh, but... Jeff Van Gundy's very opinionated. The idea that you would publicly only give the Knicks interesting time of change when they've been a dumpster fire for a decade, Jeff? Come on now. They haven't, though. Okay. That's not true. When when uh, Carmelo Anthony uh, was there and Mike Woodson, they, they won a division championship, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and they won, you know, 50-plus games. They deserve stronger words than interesting time of change. Well, 
Those were my words, so you right. can word it any way you but want. But, Jeff, I, I want that. you to coach the team. That's what I asked you. I Is there anything and, I could do and, or say and, to get and you to coach you the team? you said you didn't want the job, right. but I, you're still out there coach politicking by not saying anything bad about the obviously bad. Well, I'm going to say, like, I'll, I'll, I, I am biased when it comes to the Knicks. So, um, them and the Rockets, when particularly with the Knicks, when they give you an opportunity that no one else gave you way back when you were in your 30s, which has sort of set you up for the rest of every good thing that's happened basketball wise. Fair enough. I'm not gonna. I'm not taking shots at <laughs> okay, them. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Well, Jeff, I want to follow up on Stu Gantz's question. We just saw John Gruden come back into coaching after being out of it about the same time you've been out of it. Does Jeff Van Gundy coach again in the NBA? Well, listen, I can. I, I don't know if I ever coach again, uh, but I can guarantee you this one thing. If someone's willing to give me ten million like they gave Gruden, I'm back. I don't care what city. It could be a G League city. Well that's it. So that would be the answer. Ten million. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So like right, if, they, if they want to come with the Gruden contract <laughs> Count me in, Jeff. Though yet Stan got a good contract, he didn't get that one, and I wouldn't want I wouldn't want what he the misery he's experiencing right now over the job you got. Well, I think you're right. At some point, the hardest part place to be in sports is when you're like in the mix, like they're ninth right now in the East or were this year, and they're hovering around. They need one good thing to go right. And whether it's a draft choice, a trade, you know, something. And listen, it's hard. It's hard to go from uh, uh, really bad, which is what he took over in Detroit, to get good. And I think uh, rebuilding seems fun until you actually have to go through rebuilding. And it can be painful. There's no question about that. Can we test this with Jeff, Jeff Van Gundy saying $10 million to coach in the G League? Can we test Throw some jobs at him that he might not be willing to take for $10 million. <laughs> Greensboro Swarm, done. Erie Bayhawks, finished. Uh, Westchester County, is it the Westchester Knicks, I think? Absolutely. All, All right. right. So $10 million, Like I think that is in the G League. That probably kills your budget. <laughs> by like I'd say nine million, yeah. you know. Yeah. So yeah. All right, Jeff. Thank you for the insight, sir. We appreciate it. Right. You got it. Take care. Right. Sad. Sad. Uncle Fatty, new water world isn't going to pay for itself. You know what's sad? The Knicks uh, just interviewed Mike Brown. I mean, this is it's a disaster. And what Jeff is telling you there, I mean, he's not going to say it, but what he's telling you is that team's not good enough. Uh, that's it, because I guarantee you, he'd coach the Celtics for a buck, a <laughs> buck. A dollar. Why is it that you want Jeff and Gundy to coach the Knicks so bad? Is it because he's a good coach or because you want access? I want access. Uh, I mean, and Mike, he during this is something we're going to argue about in the next segment. Access. But because Boston has won one series in seven games, yeah. and because Boston has won game one of the second series, Stugatz wants to talk about whether the Celtics are better than the Warriors if the Celtics are healthy. And he does this just because names are returning. Injured names are returning, yeah. and he thinks the Celtics are now better than the Warriors. I mean, it's not uh, it's not ridiculous, not out of the question. Kyrie, Gordon Hayward, Jalen Brown might be a team that could beat the Warriors in the NBA Finals. I mean, and Scary Terry. Don Libertard. <laughs> Do you mind cleaning that up and tearing up papers and stuff when we're not on the air? Stugatz. I did it without really thinking. It was far from the mic. Didn't think it'd pick it up. As a kid, I used to make the sound of ripping paper. I used to delight my friends with that. Mm-hmm. And also, you can go like that. This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. We've got some stories to tell you about Alonzo Highsmith in a second. Many of you probably don't know that name. We'll get to it in a second. Greg Cody of the Miami Herald has covered Alonzo Highsmith since he <laughs> was the best athlete in the history of University of Miami football. But before we get to that, a tweeter writes in, why rail on the NFL for being dangerous when oil rig workers and countless others make far less money and work in more dangerous conditions? It's not just that NFL players make millions. It's that tougher people make less for more risk. Hashtag, it's getting old. Is that 
Guy. Let me tell you what this is in response to. Okay. This is in response to Ryan Shazier dragging his legs across a stage because of what football did to him in the draft because of the risk of football. And someone pointed this out. Mike, can this be true? This cannot be true, right? Someone pointed out something that I didn't even realize. And if it's true, made the symbolism of this all the sadder as everybody was applauding Ryan Shazier for being a athlete who's courageous and tough, who could barely walk across a stage in front of people because of what football did to him. Did he actually get up there and the pick that was announced, was it his replacement? Was the pick that was the pick that was chosen second year, his body destroyed. That's a player, right? Second year, Shazier, his body destroyed in a way that he might not be able to play football again, even as he says he wants to play football again, hopes to, uh, aspires to, but what was the Steelers' pick? Because someone said that to me, and it didn't sound right. No, it, no, he was a safety from Virginia Tech, so not the same position. Right. And Shazier, it looks like he's played four seasons here. So to have a body like that, that's what they're responding to. Mm-hmm. The idea that Shazier would come and walk across the stage with some difficulty, and we're talking about whether oil rig workers – have dangerous jobs. And of course they have dangerous jobs. And of course they have jobs that make uh, less money. They're also uh, less valuable to a business. Right. And, right. and you know, and more disposable somehow, even though the NFL is plenty disposable. Well, people aren't coming out and paying money to see them do their job, to do their craft. I mean, it's that it's that simple. But it, what is it about that argument? It's it's as old as sports radio. Well, the, I think well, I think one of the things he's trying to say or she is trying to say, the texter is you go into these professions knowing there's an inherent risk that there is that you go into these professions knowing know, that the, they are but, dangerous but, but, jobs. But when the risks become so, we tend to mourn. For the coal miners who die under that risk, Ryan Shazier walks across the stage. I talk about it in a way that's less than inspiring. You get mad at me and tell me how little money oil rig workers make. (laughs) What I find interesting about the Shazier thing is he wouldn't be up there on that stage if he were saying football's too dangerous. My son's never going to play football. He's up there on that stage because... Goodell loves the fact that he's suffered this debilitating injury but still hopes to play again. That becomes a positive for the NFL instead of a negative. I mean, man, when you say... you got to be careful saying Goodell loves... Goodell that, loves right. a debilitating injury. No, no like, I didn't say that. I, mean, I you said, did say that. Well, I think what you're trying to say is he loves the fact that this is a guy who's not slamming football. He's saying, exactly no, I'm going to get up again. Yes. I'm going to try this thing again because I love this thing so I much. I felt right. pretty alone not being inspired by that and just being sort of haunted by it. I didn't feel like I had a whole lot of support on that one. Oil rig workers make nearly $100,000 a year. Too much, right? Not bad. I don't know. It's a very difficult life. You're away from your family. You're not really around yeah, but anything. But, I mean, you make $100,000 a year, though. You should endure any suffering. I mean, you should eat feces. It's $100,000 a year. You should eat You should eat feces for $100,000 a year. That was in 2012, too, so the number may be higher now. Big pay, pay increase. Yeah. I think we should go after oil rig workers now. Let's do that. Let's go after them as being paid too much for their risks. Yeah. There are plenty of other people taking risks. That's right. Teachers deserve more than oil rig workers. That's right. I wish I was an oil rig worker. Don Lebatard. Cody's unruly. He hasn't talked into a microphone in a while, and he's like, I, I, his energy level is too high. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> yeah. I have a microphone set up, like a dead microphone set up in my house, and anytime I'm having a conversation with my wife, I now talk into a dead microphone. I feel like you're peaking early, though. Like, you're going to be exhausted oh, by I'm, 1030. I'm tired yeah. already. Yeah. Stugats. You're usually exceptional at staying in your in your lane. Yeah, I got a torque and, uh, back. I'm sorry. You're, you're, you're weaving all over the the highway. <laughs> You're sideswiping everybody. This is the Don Lebatar show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. All right, let me explain to you what was happening during the break here. Greg Cody's got a back in my day uh, that's ready to go. We will get to it shortly. How do you feel about it, Greg? How do you feel about your back in my day? I actually like this one. All right. Oh, wow. All right. Wow. He never does that. Doesn't mean so, others all right, will. All but, right, let's yeah. go. Let's see what we're going to do here. But before we do that, I want you just to hear what it is that happened during the break. Jason Witten 
Stugatz is mumbling and muttering around the studio. This is as Billy says, Cy Young was really good. This is a thing that happened during the break. Billy was like, man, Cy Young was good. Yeah, best picture ever. Doesn't get enough credit. Yeah, right. Like, seriously. No, Billy was looking at, go ahead, Billy. Go not you give the people. His 20- 1901 season, Dan, oh. was crazy. Oh. 33 and 10, 162 ERA, and a .972 whip. And that was like his best season, but he had a bunch that were close. Like his 1896 season was good. <laughs> his 1903 season was good. This guy was really good. Yeah. You covered him, right, Greg? Yeah, I remember that 03 <laughs> season, man. He was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so while this is happening, though, I'm not even making this up. This is happening from Stugatz, mumbling and grumbling as he reads reports on the Internet of Jason Witten playing $4 million a year or being paid $4 million a year reportedly to do Monday Night Football. Stugatz mumbles and grumbles walking past me on the way to the fridge and actually says, I should have played football. <laughs> to which I say to Stugatz, that wouldn't have gone well for you. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Be out of the league by now, probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. Seeing as how Darren Sproles had like two, you know, a concussed face and a broken elbow and a torn knee ligament on one play. Yeah. 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 Maybe in the early days, but at 46, tough yeah. road to hoe. I mean, yeah. yeah. Listen, not everyone could be Tom Brady. That's actually something that happened. I felt the folds of hairy fat <laughs> pressed up against me and the plumber's butt as he reached in the fridge, muttering in a way that echoed out of the fridge. I should have played football i mean four million a jealous year. of jason witten's money if that report is accurate that's more than the cowboys are offering i love him. so much the idea that jason witten would be paid more to talk about football <laughs> than injure himself playing it i think i could have done it really like maybe <laughs> six seven years as a kick returner punt returner on the same size as devin hester I got to be honest with you. I would put aside all my moral conundrums to see you return kicks for a season. I, I would pay, fair catch pay, every one of them. I, I would pay, no, I no, no. I got, the promise has to be that you return kicks. I would pay a year's salary to watch that. <laughs> I think I could pull it off, man. <laughs> I thought back in the day I would I was love quick, man. to I could see scooch. you try. I cannot explain to you how much I would love to see you try right up until, you know, I felt the remorse and the liability and you die. Like oh, that, you think that, I would die? I'd huh? feel bad then. I mean, maybe not on the first one, but on the second one. If I played an entire season as a kick returner, yes. you I, think that I would die? I would well, make the season? This is what I'm saying to you. If you played an entire season as a kick returner, I would enjoy watching you die from game to game over half a season. I mean, like, because you'd get weaker as you went. And, <laughs> and, and. You can't hit what you can't catch, Dan. That's all I'm telling you. Look at Ted Ginn. I mean, you runs out of bounds. <laughs> That's true, actually. Stugatz would, actually, I, Stugatz would win that scam as well because Stugatz would run out of bounds at the three yard line on every return kick. He would average one and a half yards per kickoff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like he'd run, there'd be so many safeties. He'd run backwards. If I did that for nine years, ten years, let's say, one and a half yards per kickoff return, do you think it would land me the Monday Night Football game? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Because Jason Witten hasn't said a damn interesting thing in his entire career. As an NFL player, but he was a tight end for the Cowboys, so yeah. put him in the booth. <laughs> and people buy it up because I've told you before, it doesn't matter what they do with that. People are going to watch no matter what. doesn't matter who's talking about it, a comedian, anybody else. You could pay the color man $4 million a year or you could not pay any- anything at all. They're going to be there anyway. And, both, and most people would watch anyway. <laughs> all of them would watch anyway. You wouldn't lose a single viewer, actually. <laughs> Not one. If you just <laughs> if you just eliminated the, the, the anybody in the booth, if you just took the booth out, you wouldn't right. lose a viewer. Just put the game on with no sound. That's right. I think you're right. <laughs> you wouldn't not a viewer. People would go find their addiction on the radio or the internet. They'd find a radio broadcast somewhere. Time now for Greg Cody's back in my day. And now it is time to take a trip down memory lane. Here's your guy, Greg Cody, with Back in My Day. Mattresses. Once again, another example of how we have perfected the dubious art of turning something simple into something complicated. Why are we making a science out of sleep, anyway? 
It ain't that complicated, folks. You get tired, you crawl under cool sheets, you lay your skull on a pillow, and <laughs> ten minutes later you've dozed deeply into that recurring dream involving Scarlett Johansson and a pack of cigarette-smoking llamas and red velvet jackets. There used to be two kinds of mattresses, soft and firm. Now you walk into any mattress store and it's mind-numbing, brain-beating ordeal of excessive variety. There's special mattresses for lower back pain now. In my mind, that's any mattress plus three Advil. They have remote control <laughs> adjustable mattresses, too. I had one of those once. It accidentally animated during the middle of the night and nearly accordion me to death. Also had a water bed once. Ended up spending 600 bucks a year on Dramamine. Gel beds, air beds, pricey feather beds. Hey, how about you just slap a layer of foam over some coils and point me in the right direction? Sleep number mattresses are apparently popular. Why? I'm not a math professor. I don't want a bed that's smarter than me. I just want a big, dumb, soft rectangle that I can collapse onto every night. Memory foam. There's another one. Come on. Like I said, I don't want a bed smarter than me. Anyway, there's something creepy about a bed with a memory. Sounds like a potential extortion situation. I'm in my bedroom overheard plotting a bank heist on the phone, and the next thing I know, the district attorney is deposing my memory bed. We need a simple bed we can trust, folks. It's just sleep. You shouldn't have to plug in a bed, and it shouldn't move or light up with a number or come with directions. Just make mine soft or firm, and either way, in five minutes, I'll be sawing wood like a lumberjack. I'm Greg Cody, yeah. and that's how it was back in my day. Yeah. Excellent yes. work. Excellent work, except for this note that Stugatz passed me during Greg Cody's back in my day. He knows! And the note is, Greg Cody has been asking me to ask sales for a free mattress for an entire year. <laughs> Fraud! Chickens, where you at? Where you at, chickens? <laughs> Which I haven't gotten yet. What? <laughs> Mother's that, Day. Now you're never going to get it. Mother's Day, yeah. You took out the entire industry. Cash more of the Dan Levatar Show with the Stugats. 10 to 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. Don Lebatard. I don't like when, like, big-time celebrities, they get so big and then they're going to write a children's book. It's an easy cash grab. And quite frankly, I don't need Jack White's advice on how to raise my children. It's annoying. Sorry. Hey, Jack White, please. Let me tell you, the last place I'm going for children advice, for child advice, for parenting advice, is to Jack White and his stupid book. Jack White. Stugatz. And honestly, who is Jack White? Pretentious Jack White. Hey, I'm going to fire up a children's book. Tell you how to parent your kids. Leave me alone. Just write new songs. Stop writing books. Write new songs. This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugatz on ESPN Radio. Mark, you're on with Ron McGill of Zoo Miami. Go ahead. Hey, Ron, we pulled a live baby possum out of our pool this morning. What are some animals that can survive really harsh conditions? Thanks. Oh, there's tons of animals. You know, anything that lives in the desert, anything that lives in the Arctic, I mean, these are all animals that survive extremely harsh conditions. You talk about an emperor penguin that will incubate an egg for weeks without eating a single thing. It keeps the egg on its feet so it doesn't get frozen in the snow and incubates it while the male does that, while the female goes out and gets food for weeks. And he waits there for weeks for her to come back in these extreme harsh conditions. Or you look like something like, a, you know, some of these lizards that live in the desert. You'll see them when they walk. They actually will lift two feet. Put two feet down. Lift two feet, put two feet down. Little side, so they don't burn their feet. I mean, these animals have all adapted to these extreme conditions. Taylor, you're on with Ron McGill of Zoo Miami. Go ahead, Taylor. Hey, Ron. I was, there was a man in Spain who claims he was raised by wolves for the age of 10. I want to know if this is actually possible. And also, why are my dog's teeth whiter than mine? Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, being raised by wolves since the age of 10, I don't really... I mean, not, not since the age of that. 10 till the age of 10, but I don't know no, that, that changed. I'm sorry. At all. Sorry. And in, in other words, since he was an infant baby that these wolves raised him, brought food to him and raised him. I don't think so. Uh, and then these are people just looking for some, you know, social media hits. Uh, it's not going to happen. Um, as far as what was the other question? Oh, his teeth. Yeah, his teeth are probably his dog's teeth are probably wider because he probably, I don't know, drinks too much coffee, chews tobacco and doesn't brush him enough. <laughs> Uh, Ron, TripAdvisor has stopped selling tickets to experiences that force animals to perform for entertainment. What do you think of that? Kudos. Absolutely kudos. You know, this is things that... Um 
the, the thing is, you, you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I mean, there are some experiences with animals do not force animals to do things. Like, for instance, swimming with the dolphins. Swimming with the dolphins, if you do it in some places like Mexico and some of these resort islands, those are cool situations. These people are pulling these dolphins in and making them do things out of the wild that are horrific. Then you have other great experiences like a sea world where these animals were born under human care. They've been cared for well. They're not forced to do anything. It's a, it's a black and white situation. So people shouldn't paint with a broad brush that way and think all of those things are bad. But generally speaking, I think TripAdvisor's goal here is a, no, is a noble one, and it is to stop exploiting animals just for profit. Why were you on CNN this week? What was the story they were asking you about? Oh, the pelicans. You know, these pelicans that flew into the Pepperdine University graduation. These two pelicans kind of <laughs> flew right into the middle of the graduation, landed on these people, and people like freaking, oh, my God, why are these pelicans flying in? And the, the CNN anchor goes, you know, they're nowhere near the ocean. Well, they, yes, they are. Pepperdine is right up the street from Malibu, right down the street from the Santa Monica Pier. And anybody who lives here in Florida knows that pelicans are very gregarious. These were young juveniles. They, they didn't have adult coloration yet. So they've probably been yet getting used to being fed at the pier, being fed at the beach. And they saw these people down there and said, hey, there's food down there. So they flew down to the people with food, and people had food. They freaked out, and people were thinking, oh my God, it's Hitchcock's the bird. It's bird. No, they were just looking for some food. And then some guy tries to pick up the pelican, not smart, so the pelican bites him, and all of a sudden it's this attack pelican. Jesus Christmas, you guys in the media are so, so sensationalistic. Well, the pelican did attack. Yeah. Like that. It did not attack. It defended itself, Dan. If someone goes to grab you that you don't know, what are you going to do? You're going to go, oh, hi? No. You're going to defend yourself. Okay? No, I'm not going to bite pelican him. did not attack. I'm not going to bite him. Well, if you thought you were going to die and that was the only option you had, it's not like the pelican has anything else. He's got his beak. What is he going to do, hit him with his wings? He couldn't because the guy was grabbing him by the wings. Fair okay, P- People should not be grabbing wild animals. You know what? It serves them right. Ooh. Wow. Ooh, I, think, wow. I think the NBA fined Anthony Davis for biting that guy, by the way. <laughs> God, I love this segment. Kevin, you're on with Ron, Ron McGill. Con, uh, that doesn't mean anything. Kevin, you're on with Ron McGill. Go ahead. Hey, Ron, long time, third time. Um, I was wondering, could a gorilla be trained to run a seven-yard button hook and become a Hall of Fame tight end? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, seriously. Could we train, yes. well, could we train a gorilla on, on, uh, on, other than Gronk, could we train a gorilla, hut, 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 and then he runs a seven-yard button hook? I'm pretty sure you could, yes. I'm pretty sure you could. It would take some time. You'd have to create a lot of bridges within the training, but gorillas are incredibly intelligent animals, and I'm... I'm sure with the right amount of time, you could do it. What animal, Ron, would be the best kick returner? Best kick returner? Wow. Um, Well, you know, again, guys, you know, this goes to one of my original quotes a long time ago. I'm going with the rhino because you don't have to be fast. You don't have to be... You don't have to be quick in making cuts. You just have to go forward, and who's going to stop you? You get the rhino. He puts the freaking ball between the two horns on his head, and he runs straight ahead. Who's stopping him? Nobody. That's your kick returner right there. You don't there. think he's got a fumbling problem? Dan, Dan, you know, you always try to come up with these little types of things. I'm telling you, a fair question. he puts the ball right between his two horns on his head, and he runs straight okay. ahead. All right. Nothing all right. stops so, him. All right, so no fumbling problem. But, I mean, there are some other problems with your theories, including we got a snap count problem on this gorilla button hook thing. Like, he, we're going to have to go on the same snap every time, or can Dan, you train the Dan, gorilla to Dan, go on Dan, different Dan, counts? Dan, 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 you know what the problem is? Let me tell you what the problem is. We're talking about gorillas doing button hooks and rhinos making kick returns that's what the problem is well okay. how does a rhino call for a fair catch how would that work oh my god that's right Jeez. that's true yeah, they don't need to call point. for a fair catch Stugatz, because once they got the ball they just run they don't have to catch for it. nobody's going to tackle the rhino okay nobody's tackling the rhino sometimes talking to you guys you know you you, you keep perpetuating that stereotype about sports jocks also, you're putting a football in between two horns. Have, are you not familiar oh with Charles my Peanut God, Tillman? Mike, are you jumping on this? Are you really jumping in on I'm this, just, Mike? Someone's going to punch it out, Ron. And I got one of the ostriches doing, doing it. My kick return is a bird. Nobody would touch him. Nick, you're on with Ron McGill, Zoo <laughs> Miami. Go ahead, Ray. Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> Flies right over. Uh, yeah, I was told. Well, that what about if other birds are coming, Greg? Yeah, there's no birds in no, football. I'm putting just nothing but no. I'm putting well, you nothing but that. birds. No, I, you no, didn't no. make that statement, Greg. You didn't. You didn't make that statement. Right. You didn't say there's no birds on the on the uh, kicking team. You you now. If okay. a falcon held a football in his talons, would it puncture the football, or is the All height right, of no, the football? No. Hold on a second. Let's do this correctly. If Greg Cody's bird is kick returning, what is the fleet of birds I have to put on the opposite side so that that bird can succeed? Peregrine Falcons. Well, my return is a falcon. I got the Peregrine Falcon. So now what up. are you going to do? Right. Now what are you going to do? He's, okay. got, he's okay. got the falcon. And, right. I, and, I got, and I got a team of Peregrine Falcons, okay? 
Right. But it's what if he has a team of Falcons right. blocking for his Falcon, right? right? Yeah, it's all Falcons. That's just a bunch right. of feathers. My team's the Falcons. Hey, you know get, get, get to your this own guy's team. question because you guys are ridiculous. Get to this guy's question. <laughs> Brandon, you're on with Ron McGill of Zoo Miami. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, I have two ducks that hang around my pool, but only the male swims, and the female just sits there and watches them swim for about 20 minutes, and then they fly off. <laughs> What's going on there? <laughs> You know what? I re- I really don't know. Um, maybe he's courting her. Maybe the swim is kind of a dance that he's doing to try to court her to convince her that he's worthy. Um, I-, I really don't have a really good answer for that. That it's just the male going into the water. That seems strange to me. Well, ducks don't do ducks do the same sort of courting dances that other birds do, like the birds of paradise that do these these fancy dances. No, 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 not fancy dances, but they do a type of courtship. You know, you everybody seen the Muscovies down here? They kind of move their heads back. <laughs> and they waddle back and forth. You know, every animal has a type of courtship. Some of them are very subtle. Some of them are very obvious. Um, but there is courtship. It's not like they just go up there, hey, I want it now. That doesn't happen that way. Patrick, you're on with Ron McGill of Zoo Miami. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, hey, Ron. I just saw a herd of bison near, uh, well, actually, in Yellowstone National Park. Just wondering what is the difference between a bison and a buffalo? It's a good question. Well, uh, there are no buffalo in the United States. Buffalo are an old world um, bovine, you know, the, the uh, Cape buffalo of Africa, the water buffalo of India and Asia. Those are true buffaloes. Uh, the bison is what many people call the American buffalo. Are uh, you ready with a video? You got a video to do play? Oh, yeah, play I got on? the video here. Hold on. Let me go. Let me look at it. Uh, up comes the video. Play again. Here we go. Play. Oh, the vampire squid. Oh, this is taking a Monterey Aquarium. It's beautiful squid. What it does is, it's, it's, I don't know if it's going to do anything, but it's this blood red squid, incredible. Oh, see when it opens up, when it opens up its tentacles underneath, it looks like, uh, you remember that, that movie Alien? The prey of the alien, the oh, mouth of the alien? Oh, That's what it looks like. oh my God. Oh, look at that. What is that? Yeah, that's it. It's the mouth of the alien. It's like spines coming out. What is that? What it, what it does? What it does when it gets scared? When it gets scared, it'll shoot out this like blood red kind of ink to, to kind of disorient the predator, and it goes away. And that's what it does. But it's really cool when it opens those. You know, it looks really smooth on the outside. It opens those tentacles. You see those spines. It's like the mouth of predator. That's where these movie people get ideas for a lot of their monsters. Is from real life animals. Wait a minute, but what the hell was that? It looked like he had just a bunch of fish carcasses in his. Uh... No, it's not fish carcasses. Those are just fleshy spines. But they look intimidating they disorient the potential predator and then they shoot out this ink that totally clouds the water and they can get away wow. it's all, it, listen there's a method nature's fantastic man, that's man. why this is such a fun segment man this looks like something out of that uh, what is that movie with the plants that have teeth like the the little shop Venus of Life horrors Life little little shop of horrors is what yeah. it looks like Hydra. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but if you look at it closely really look at the movie alien when the alien opens its mouth that's exactly what it looks like inside it's perfect all right, Ron. We'll wow. talk to you next week. Uh, we'll talk to you next Love week, you guys, buddy. man. All right, see you. Okay, bye-bye. Vampire squid, man. Otherwise known as Rick Pitino. This show ain't free. Time for some ads. What? It's an upset. Don Lebertard. When did we stop, and why did we stop throwing rice at weddings? I think it's been fairly recent, and there's a specific reason for it, but I'm not sure what it is. I think you could put an eye out. Uh, by throwing rice, that's that's for starters. I think it has something to do with being bad for birds. I could be wrong. Stugats. You know, I think yes. that is it. Plus, yeah. Uncle Ben objected to it as yeah. well. It's a misuse of his product, okay? <laughs> Uncle Ben's converted rice is high-minded. He wants it used for a pilaf, uh, you know, just for a beautiful <laughs> side dish, uh, not to be thrown like a rag. This is the Don Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. For many years, we have had many impersonators around here, and we have aired in the past. I have aired in the past saying that the man who's about to join us is the worst of those impersonators. But lately, he has been unveiling encyclopedic knowledge of Howard Cosell that is unusual. And we were talking about Jason Witten. Jason Witten might be in the Monday night booth. Greg Cody, of course, because he covered Cy Young's 19, amazing 1903 season. Uh, Greg Cody has said that announcers don't matter, but that there was once upon a time that Howard Cosell mattered and would actually move ratings. So the fake Howard Cosell joins us now. And for the young people who don't understand, back when broadcasting was broadcasting, when Don Olmeyer was running the joint, yeah. <laughs> when when 
Howard Cosell was broadcasting, the person who would say that person that Howard Cosell isn't a ratings mover, how would uh, Howard Cosell respond to that? Well, hello, Daniel and uh, Stu Gotts. And I understand little Cody is in the room as well today. He is. Um, speak with you. I have, to, I have to say, first of all, uh, I was lunching with uh, the great Frank DeFord, who once said, never turn down the sound on Coast Cell. You poor bastards will miss the game. He was absolutely right <laughs> then, but not now. Not now? Of course, not now. Because back then you had the Giffa, you had Dan DeRue, and yours truly from the sinister Northeastern Cub Ball. And I have to say that today, nothing is special. Back then, three networks, it was special. 33 million people every single Monday night. It was Monday night football. It was Arledge. It was pageantry. And now it is simply football on Monday night. <laughs> well, what the hell you're happened? Right, right. What happened, right. Howard Cosell? What did we? What have we done? What has our company done to your legacy on Monday Night Football? Can you believe it? But look, you recall when Dan DeRue left for NBC yeah. and the Police Story Anthology, we brought in a kid by the name of Fred the Hammer Williamson, and that was an unmitigated disaster. And then we followed it up with Alex Karras, the laconic one. And then finally, Dan DeRue came back. He returned. But then I had had it with the jocks. I walked away in 1983. And you remember when I left, they brought in O.J. and Joe, Willie, name it. And that was a disaster. Today, it just doesn't matter who's in the booth. A coach by the name of Gruden was the best part of that show. And that tells you all you need to know about Monday Night Football. What is your relationship <laughs> with O.J. Simpson now? Well, we'll wait till he gets here. I understand he's going to be good with the barbecue. Uh, that's all I can say. All right, all right. We went too long with the bit. See yeah. you later, Howard Cosell. We appreciate all it. Right. Thank you, sir. All right. This is yours, Charlie. <laughs> say hi to our Priles when he gets here. What do you mean? He did have OJ going yeah, up to did. the same place he is. He did. Why did it take us 15 years to figure out how to correctly use the figure? Because we're not good at this. <laughs> Let's go. My private jet isn't going to fuel I got, itself. I got Guillermo telling me during the breaks that Cy Young was good. <laughs> That's why. We stink. This 1892 season, Dan, is incredible. Yeah, man. I mean, no one ever mentions him among the all-time greats. You're right. He's underappreciated, Cy Young. He really is. Yeah. He has the only unbreakable record in sports. I mean, DiMaggio, someone's going to break that at some point. Pete Rose came close, but no one's going to eclipse 511 wins ever. No one. <laughs> Nobody. Can, that... you, can you be underappreciated if you have an award named after you, though? That's a good point. But when we talk about all timers, right? It's Pedro and it's Randy Johnson and it's Koufax and yeah. this guy. No one ever says Cy Young. True. Nobody ever says it. Preach. Yeah. I'm going to be the guy that starts saying it. I think that's the thing to do in 2018. Hitch your <laughs> wagon to the sports take. Cy Young was good and underappreciated. Yeah. Well, it's definitely not Nolan Ryan. I mean. Red Grange was also underappreciated. Wherever you may roam, having the Capital One Venture Card is advantageous while traveling. Tell them, Stugat. The galloping ghost, huh? Indeed. <laughs> Love that guy. Don Lebatard. You decided to celebrate Guillermo's horrible contribution to the show with a hello. Hello. Stugats. That's an affirmation. When, when you get a hello from me... Uh, that's like the equivalent of five exclamation points or four and a half smiley faces. Hello. This is the Don Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Dan Lebatar Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil performance line. Here's your Sports Center update. The NFL is not eliminating kickoffs. Instead, the league is considering changes to kickoff alignment and formations in the name of player safety. Baker Mayfield's agent said that the Patriots were willing to trade up to number two in the draft to draft him. (laughs) 
<laughs> that is a juicy one, man. Woo! Wow. Big crap put a stop to that, right? Hey, there's no... Well, the Browns put a stop to that. He didn't get yeah. to number two. Yeah, but let's say the Browns say yes. Does crap put a stop to that? And then does Belichick do it anyway? Oh, does he order the code red? Oh, what are you talking about? What do you mean? <laughs> And finally, really? huge iceberg. That, that's very interesting. No, I, I'm not want disputing that it's interesting. I'm disputing what you find interesting about it, oh. which is Bill Belichick o- ordering a code red <laughs> to draft someone his owner doesn't want. Like, you just don't pay any attention to the things that move from what's left of your brain to your mouth. You pull a fast one while the owner's not looking. Because, you know, early in the draft, Kraft doesn't think anything's going on. The team makes a Super Bowl every year. Then you just kind of sneak it in, and all of a sudden, Bob Kraft shows up to training camp at Baker Mayfield's on the roster. How about that? (laughs) And finally, huge icebergs could be towed from Antarctica to Cape Town in a bid to solve South Africa's worst drought in a century. Marine salvage experts are floating the plan to tug the icebergs to the region after it's seen the worst water uh, shortage in decades. Salvage master Nick Sloan told Reuters news agency he was looking for government and private investors for a scheme to guide huge chunks of ice across the ocean, chop them into a slurry, and melt them down into millions of liters of drinking water. How about that? Hmm. Elon Musk involved in that thing, huh? This Mother's Day is not going to happen. That's what I mean. This Mother's Day, show your biggest fan just how much she means to you with 30 assorted tools for only $30 from 1-800-Flowers.com. To order, go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Click the radio icon. Enter code Dan. Hurry. The offer ends today. For all the latest headlines and information, tune in the Sports Center on ESPN Radio all throughout the day. Mike Ryan is a Browns fan. He is very excited about Baker Mayfield as a quarterback. If Baker Mayfield succeeds... He will be doing so largely without precedent, as far as I could tell. That style of play, Doug Flutie had marginal success with it professionally. Right. He had, he, Doug Flutie, whatever Doug Flutie was during his career while exciting, if I told you he was your quarterback right now, it would look like Tyrod Taylor. Yeah. I mean, Flutie was 5'9. Yeah. And I mean, I know, but Baker Mayfield, six foot scrambler guy who's, who, and five eighths. Six and five eighths. <laughs> <laughs> scrambler guy who's really elusive um you know that feels like Johnny Manziel again now the patriots saying they were going to trade up to number 2 to get him according to Mayfield's agent it it validates it doesn't it as soon as as a browns fan as soon as i heard the patriots were sniffing around hoping to get their paws on Baker Mayfield at 2 makes me think that Oh, we made a hell of a pick in Baker Mayfield. And I know that you mentioned, yes, he has scrambling ability, but he's always looking to throw. This isn't a Johnny Manziel type that that you don't know if they're looking to throw and run or, or run. He's an incredible thrower of the football in terms of accuracy and reads. He lost his two best receivers one year, and he got better. He's that's, incredible. That's what the Jets loved about him. They were saying they loved his accuracy, that he was so accurate with the football. I'm jealous. Mike is right, because if the Patriots and Belichick, if the agents telling the truth here, put their stamp on a guy, then you feel better about the guy you yes. took. I'm jealous that the, Je- that the Patriots didn't want Sam well, Darnold. Well, well, wait a minute, though. But it's not just that the Patriots are doing it. It's the nature of the transaction that the Patriots never do. They're never interested in, in winning the draft by trading up. They're never interested in in winning free agency in the first few days. They're always interested in value. So to me, the biggest credence isn't that the Patriots are doing it because they're champions. It's because the Patriots' business model is built on value, value, value. You don't trade up. You get Randy Moss for a fourth-round pick when he's in the dumps in Oakland. You you go down. You find value. It's not just the Patriots. Sean McVay, now reputed to be a quarterback whisperer. We saw what he did with golf. He was. I saw Jeff Darlington saying that if uh, Sean McVay was convinced that if he didn't have his ride or die in Jared Goff, he was going to do everything in his power to convince the Rams to get Baker Mayfield. And I know that uh, John Dorsey is eighty five percent Braves and only fifteen percent A's, but he used an advanced stat in, in defending Baker Mayfield's height. I'm not sure how advanced it is, but out of all the group. Uh, all those first round quarterbacks, the dude with the least amount of batted balls at the line of scrimmage was Baker Mayfield, the biggest concern for height. Who's the guy? That's interesting because I think I'd rather have Sean McVay endorse the quarterback than the Patriots or Bill Belichick. Well, but I think. regardless, if right? they're both endorsing the quarterback, uh, 
then it seems less laughable on the Browns if they have a way of measuring his accuracy that would suggest to them he's Drew Brees accurate. And you've seen those YouTube videos of Drew Brees sports science going up against Olympic archers and being able to be more accurate at 20 yards. If he is capable of uncommon accuracy, like Drew Brees, mm-hmm. it erases the doubts about the height. Right. And I'm telling you, that's what the Jets loved about him. It, it's funny because the Jets general manager did an interview recently where he said, we got our guy, Sam Darnold. And he said, we moved up to three to get Sam Darnold. And then in the same interview said, we never thought Sam Darnold would be there. Well, then you didn't move up to number three to get Sam Darnold if you didn't think <laughs> Sam Darnold was going to be there. You moved up to get Baker Mayfield, and the Browns took your guy. And Todd Bowles has had opportunities to say Sam Darnold was atop their draft board, and for whatever reason, even though it serves everybody involved, he doesn't take the bait, and he does he refuses <laughs> to answer that question. Now, a lot of people were laughing at the Browns because it's a Browns thing to do to draft a short quarterback who never goes number one. But you, he would have been gone at number two if you were to believe Baker Mayfield's agent. He certainly would have been gone at number three if Todd Bowles just w- were to answer question honestly mike's right though as a as a browns fan if you get the patriots saying yeah we really like this guy that means a lot i mean the patriots are the gold standard in the nfl in a way that very few teams are in other sports do we know if it's true though has anyone confirmed it i mean the agent saying it does that make it so i mean does it matter it's so juicy well wait a minute does it matter <laughs> i mean the agent the said agent, it okay, I, said, I can't control I mean, but what the agents agent are professional liars well let's, uh, let's source it. i believe he said it on an andrew brandt podcast what 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 does the agent stand to gain other than everyone just thinking? Oh Baker no! Mayfield's that what the agent awesome. stands to gain is that my client everyone thinks he's good here's how i can endorse it you know who the notary is bill belichick like yeah. what do you mean i mean that's I, I'm not going, I'd like Adam Schefter, someone else. Agents just say things all the time. But I haven't heard Belichick or the Patriots say it's not so. Yeah, but they don't ever do that, Stugatz. That's why the agent can do it. I don't think an agent wants to get on the wrong side of the Patriots. I think that's a, a franchise that you want to stay on good terms. I'm not positive that the agent would know if the Patriots were going to trade up to get him. The most private organization in sports is going to tell the agent for Baker Mayfield will trade up to number two to get him. Really? They're yes. going to give away their secrets yeah. to the agent of Baker but Mayfield. Maybe it wasn't the Patriots. Maybe it was Gettleman. They had the number two pick. I mean, <laughs> they did. I mean... Maybe they were the ones that offered a warm pretzel and a hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have that sound of Gettleman? I want to hear that again. I mean, you you think that Belichick was the one? Put it on the poll, Guillermo. Was Belichick the one who wasted Gettleman's time? Because Gettleman, the general manager of the Giants, said that a whole lot of people were calling, wasting his time. And so, is that what the agent for Baker Mayfield is actually saying? That that the Patriots went and offered Gettleman. They tried to trick him with a hot dog. And so that's what the agent is saying. The Patriots are willing to go up number two if Gettleman would have gotten fooled by a Kanish. <laughs> right? Like, if that's, he didn't have time for that though. Gettleman was too busy making moves. That's right. You know, people call you and they want, they, they want the second pick of the draft for, you know, a bag of donuts, a hot pretzel, and a hot dog. You know, it's like, you get away, leave me alone. I ain't got time to screw around. <laughs> totally Belichick. I just love how busy Gettleman Great. is. You know, is that Belichick again? Is he offering more than the donuts and the hot dogs? I ain't got time for this. His mouth is like watering when he says hot pretzel, by the way. <laughs> Does it? Let's hear it. Let's see. Let, put that on the poll as well, Guillermo. Was Gettleman's you mouth know, watering as he said hot pretzel? You know, people call you and they want they, they want the second pick of the draft for you know, a bag of donuts, a hot pretzel, and a hot dog. You know, it's like, yeah, you get away. Yeah, Leave me alone. Yeah, yeah, I ain't got time yeah. to screw around. No question. Salivating. I'm voting yes on that. Yep. You can listen to the Dan Levatar Show with the Stugats 10 to 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio, and you can watch on ESPN News.